Grand Central Station is a New York icon. The main concourse is often used in movies and TV shows, and it's not hard to see why. 67 million train commuters get to enjoy the view in person as they enter or leave Manhattan. It's also located at the terminus of Park Avenue along 42nd Street. It's in the same league as the Empire State Building or Central Park. So how would you feel if the city proposed to demolish the above ground part of the station to build an ugly sports arena? Not a good idea, right? Well, that's exactly what happened to the original Penn Station, also located in Midtown Manhattan on the west side. Penn Station was arguably even grander than Grand Central Station. It was built in 1910 and featured a cavernous and beautiful main waiting room. It was one of the largest indoor public spaces in the world and had some of the same basic proportions as St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, which is the largest church on the planet. The interior design of the space also references St. Peter's and features Italian travertine and Renaissance neoclassical architecture. Unfortunately, the station was built with the assumption that travel by train would continue to grow in popularity, but instead, Airplanes became popular and long-distance train travel declined. As the station lost money and became more and more unkempt, the Pennsylvania Railroad realized that they needed to make some serious changes to keep making a profit. This led to their controversial decision to sell the air rights of the land to a company that ended up demolishing the incredible above-ground portion of the station in the early 1960s. They replaced it with Madison Square Garden, a skyscraper, and two other office buildings. The station's demolition was a blow to the growing historic preservation movement in the United States, but the result was the establishment of the NYC Landmarks Preservation Commission just a few years later, which in turn ended up saving Grand Central Station from a similar fate. I have a video about Grand Central Station if you want more information on that saga. This Penn Station story is the one most pointed to by preservationists, as it clearly demonstrates what can be lost without local governments preserving our built heritage. And if every preservation case was as clear-cut as that one, I wouldn't be making this video but I'm making this video because some people misuse historic preservation to exclude people and prevent neighborhood change. Let's dive into the seedy underbelly of historic preservation after the bike bell. The Penn Station case is an example of a historic building and historic buildings generally have a lower impact on cities than historic districts. Historic districts are neighborhoods designated as historic with contributing and non-contributing buildings. Contributing buildings are historic, while non-contributing buildings are not. The idea of a historic district is that you have a high percentage of historic buildings in one place, and they contribute to a historic narrative or demonstrate a historic style. Creating a district is more efficient than individually marking each building as historic. If you want a great rundown of how something is made historic, including a fascinating history of my adopted hometown of San Luis Obispo, go check out Cynical Historian's video on that very topic. There's a link in the description. He covers the good reasons to make something historic, and I'm going to talk about some of the negatives. In a city, marking one building as historic is probably not going to have major ripple effects filled with consequences both intended and unintended, but you better believe that's the case with historic districts. Let's look at the first area designated as a historic district in the United States, in Charleston, South Carolina. It's almost universally lauded as a great example of a historic district, one that has preserved a large collection of 18th and 19th century buildings. It was established by the local government in 1931 and added to the National Historic Register in the 1960s, right around the same time as the preservation movement was getting going in New York, thanks to Penn Station. The preservation of buildings is one outcome of making a district historic, but there are others as well. The Charleston Historic District was created in part to preserve the era of Southern slavery and remove black residents from the area. Indeed, in 1930, Historic Charleston was a mixed-race neighborhood, but within a decade after the introduction of the Historic District, the residents were primarily white. The Charleston Historic District removed all buildings that didn't reflect the elite images they wanted to project. This also led to decades of gentrification, making the entire district a haven for rich white residents. The district also expanded over the years, forcing out low-income and black residents with every addition. This kind of thing happens everywhere, not just the U.S. South. Philadelphia created the Society Hill Historic District in 1955. It was meant to preserve one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city, established in the 1680s. The area is full of colonial era buildings, but prior to Philadelphia creating the district, it was one of the city's most diverse neighborhoods. It was 20% black, with Eastern Europeans and Irish Catholics making up the other large blocks. By 1965, population density was cut in half and the district was 90% white, with only 3% black. Today, Society Hill is one of the most wealthy and exclusive neighborhoods in Philly. These historic districts may have preserved the historic structures, but at the expense of the communities living there. Today, the controversy from historic districts comes from the NIMBY crowd. 
The state of California passed a law called SB9 that allows for homeowners in single family zones to build a duplex on their lot and split their lot in half and build another house. That means where there was once one house on a large lot, there can now be four houses on two lots. It effectively ended single family zoning in California. This law has loopholes, however, and one of them is that it does not apply in historic or landmark districts. Now let's say you're the kind of person that doesn't want to see any change to their neighborhood at all, no new housing. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that you could just designate your entire neighborhood as a historic district and evade state law. The state government and the city of Pasadena got into a fight because Pasadena passed an emergency ordinance after the passage of SB9 that included a definition of historic district too broad for the state's liking, meaning that it could exempt larger areas of the city than necessary. Pasadena already had 20% of its land area in a historic district, fully exempt from SB9. Pasadena ended up rewriting the ordinance to put its definition of historic district in line with the state's. Palo Alto, California added over 150 properties to its historic registry to prevent them from being demolished and replaced with SB9 units. That's a valid course of action, but not every property identified is clearly historic, and some are just head scratchers. This is happening in Oregon too. In 2019, the state passed a law that said that any city over 25,000 people must allow duplexes in any residential lot. Cities in the Portland metro area must allow duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, cottage courts, and townhomes on any residential lot. And unlike California, this law applies to historic districts. But clever neighborhoods in Portland have figured out that the state requires extensive demolition review before taking down a contributing historic building in a district. That means that any time a historic building would be removed for higher density housing, it would have to go to a vote of the city council. Furthermore, these same neighborhoods have figured out that they can get a historic district approved by the National Register of Historic Places, administered by the National Park Service. Neighborhoods can seek and attain a National Register designation without city council approval. The Laurelhurst neighborhood in Portland has done just that. This process means that neighborhoods can get protection without city approval, but every demolition has to come to a full city council vote. This is a massive disincentive to building something new in these historic districts. The Neighborhood Association's own analysis shows how effective this is as a deterrent to new housing, comparing demolitions in Ladd's Addition to Selwood, both neighborhoods with historic homes, though only Ladd's Addition is on the National Register. The result is less affordable housing in neighborhoods in the inner ring of Portland suburbs with great transit and bike access. The residents of the neighborhood don't seem to care much about historic preservation either. By their own admission, property value preservation is what they're really after. With historic districts, whose history are we preserving? We tend to preserve the most grand, ornate, and impressive buildings in neighborhoods, and I think that's mostly due to their visual interest. But those buildings, particularly historic homes and mansions, could have only been built by very wealthy past residents. And the costs associated with maintaining those buildings are often only affordable to today's very wealthy residents. Urban residents serious about historic preservation need to consider alternative historic narratives when identifying sites for preservation. To Portland's credit, they have passed revisions to their historic preservation ordinance to add criteria for landmarking places of significance to queer, indigenous, and communities of color. Historic preservation is not a bad thing, and in many cases like Grand Central Station, it's absolutely a great thing. But cities are living, changing entities, and freezing a neighborhood in time makes it less able to respond to the needs of the future, often at the benefit of the wealthy and powerful and at the expense of the poor. Hey, since you made it this far, I wanted to let you know that my next video is all about college towns. The video covers topics like why do people like living in college towns? Why do town gown relations go sour? Is it a good thing to have so many students in one small town? I'll be posting it to YouTube in a few weeks, but you can actually watch it right now ad free over on Nebula. Nebula is a creator owned streaming service that I'm extremely proud to be a part of. On Nebula, you can see all of my extra content, including my great city series, planning ancient Rome, and a whole bunch of smaller bonus video content. But me and all my creator friends have started this new thing called Nebula First. Thanks to all the people who have subscribed on Nebula, I can now make my content faster and earlier. So every time you see a video posted by me on YouTube, my next video is already on Nebula. Other creators are doing the same thing, meaning that you can watch videos from Johnny Harris, Legal Eagle, Jetlag, and more earlier than you'd find them on YouTube. Now Nebula is normally priced at a completely reasonable $50 per year. But if you use my code CityBeautiful when you sign in, you get $20 off that annual plan. That brings it down to $250 a month, which is really the best deal in streaming for what you get. 
And if I could just stop for a second, I want to say that signing up for Nebula is probably the best way you can support me in this channel, as well as the educational creators on Nebula as well. There are so many great channels on there, and we're all working hard to build a great platform for subscribers. Nebula First is the next big effort, and I think you're going to love it. So go click on the link on screen or in the description to get $20 off an annual subscription to Nebula and watch my next video. It's there right now.